Today that I've entitled the suicide mission. Um, if you look up the definition of that term, suicide mission, a suicide mission is a task which is so dangerous for the people involved that they are not expected to survive. And so uh, those who participate in a suicide mission or one of two things. They're either extremely brave or they're insane. <laughs> and so, so um, our Lord Jesus, when he, when he entered Jerusalem for the final time, was embarking on a suicide mission. He had a mission that needed to be accomplished and he knew that, uh, that he wasn't going to survive it. And so I don't believe that Jesus was insane. What I do believe is that Jesus was extremely brave. He was extremely courageous. Amen. And so so we're going to read this account. This act is actually uh, before the triumphal entry. But I want to, to, to just uh, look at this account. This is the death of Lazarus. And we're not going to actually read uh, uh, into the resurrection, but I just want to I want to read some of the uh, uh, the interaction between Jesus and his disciples before they went back to to Jerusalem area uh, at this time. So let's begin reading verse one. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany. Bethany was very close to Jerusalem, uh, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are, are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask for grace. I pray for your understanding, your help, Lord, that you would... Uh, Minister grace to the hearers today. I pray for clarity and revelation of your word. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So as you see, the disciples thought that that Jesus uh, was uh, not very wise in going back to Judea because they had already tried to kill him there. And uh, I want to begin by talking to you about Jesus as a, a man with a mission. Okay, And so uh, these events that we read here um, about Lazarus were, uh, they preceded his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It was after the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And we know that day as Palm Sunday. We celebrate that today. And this would mark uh, the final week in the, uh, in the uh, mortal life of Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, Jesus, you know, to understand this properly, you've got to understand that Jesus was a wanted man. Uh, he was wanted by the by the Jewish authorities. Uh, even though Jesus never did a thing wrong, uh, he was viewed uh, kind of as a criminal. So as you read through John 11, uh, you, you read the powerful uh, testimony of the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, three, four days dead and, and uh, in the grave, uh, already putrefying, but yet he comes back to life. It was a powerful miracle. And so I want to I want to read with you in verse forty five of John eleven, and uh, you, that way you can see the attitude of the Jewish authorities. It says that many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, "What shall we do? For this man works many signs." If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our, and our nation. So they had a real fear of losing what they had. You know, uh, let me pause for a second. The you know the chief priests were were the Sadducees. They were the ones who who ran the temple, and uh, one of the things that they had was not only political prestige, but they they had gotten very very rich. Uh, with the offerings and all that and and so they were afraid of of losing what they had so then verse 49 it says and one of them Caiaphas being high priest that year said to them you know nothing at all nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that uh, and that uh, and not that the whole nation should perish now this he said he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. So here's a man who is not right with God, but yet God uses him to speak a true prophetic word. Isn't that amazing? Then verse 32, it says, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So that the death of Christ was going to benefit everyone who would believe in him. So verse 53, then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim and remained there with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that they might seize him. So, you know, this was the, the atmosphere toward Jesus uh, on, the, on that, uh, that last week of his life. And so when he did... Uh, enter into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, riding on the colt of the donkey and, and you know, them spreading uh, branches before him uh, on, the, on the ground and, and shouting, Hosanna, you know, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was a very powerful moment. And, but Jesus knew, he knew that this is what was going to happen. He knew uh, that uh, the miracles and his words... Uh, would stir hatred and fear and envy among the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. 
you know, and so the disciples, you know, when they were still, uh, you know, where they were when they got the word that uh, that uh, Lazarus was sick, when when Jesus said, "Okay, we're going to go uh, uh, to Bethany and wake him up," they were going to go back into a hostile territory. They were going to go back into the the vicinity of Jerusalem, and it was going to be uh, a very dangerous place for him. And we see here how, you know, the priest's attitude, the, the Pharisee's attitude, the scribe's attitude, they were looking at Jesus and they were, you know, they were very upset at him. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, they were like, man, everybody's believing in him. We got to do something about this man. It's, he's going to ruin our whole situation here. And, and their conclusion was, we're just going to have to kill him. And you know, there's something that is terrible, that's awful about envy. Envy is a terrible sin. You know, it, it's one of those things that, that breeds murder. Uh, if you look in chapter 12, in verse 9 through 11, it says, Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So we see here envy that fuels hate, that inspires murder. You know, and so they had murder in their hearts, man. And so, so they were afraid, they were filled with envy. And so as you read the Gospels, okay, uh, from the time of the triumphal entry, you read uh, Matthew and and Mark and Luke, uh, and they all they all uh, speak of the triumphal entry, and uh, and from that time on, you read about all the conflict between the the Jewish leaders and Jesus. There they come and they they question him. They ask him what they think are hard questions to try to entrap him, to get him to slip in his words and say something uh, that they could accuse him of. A blasphemy or accuse him of something so that they could arrest him <clears throat> and it was a wicked time and his disciples you know when they were hadn't gone to Lazarus yet they they were like hey uh, you sure you want to go back there they, they just tried to stone you then and and you want to go back and and then Thomas you know with his you know Thomas the man of faith and confidence we know him as doubting Thomas said, well, I guess let's just go with him so that we can die with him. <laughs> and so they were kind of out of their minds too. But anyway, so I want to talk to you about the courage of Jesus for a moment. He was a man with a mission. He was going to go do something that was he was called to do, but this was something that was going to require great courage on the part of the Lord Jesus. Amen. This was a suicide mission. Amen. Now let me make a clarification here. Jesus did not kill himself. Okay? Suicide is a sin. But he knew, he knew, however, that he would not survive this week. That by the end of the week, he would be crucified. He knew that the Jewish leaders hated him. He knew their murderous intentions. He, and he also knew that behind their evil desires was the master of all evil, Satan. Amen. Amen. You know, in, in John chapter 8, he had a confrontation with the Pharisees. And he said these words in verse uh, 39 to 44. It says, they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. I mean, he told them straight out. You seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. I mean, when Abraham heard from God, he obeyed God. Amen. Amen. Uh, it says, but now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. 
Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. Now here's the kicker. He said, you are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Amen. So, you know, Jesus told them straight out. You're of your father, the devil. So he knew that when he went to Jerusalem, he knew that these men hated him. He knew they were plotting to kill him. And he also knew that behind all their hatred and plotting and envy was the father of lies. Yes. And so, that you know, that's why I say Jesus, what, when he went to Jerusalem, this was not an act of insanity. This was an act of courageous courageous, uh, 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 courageousness, I guess I'll just put it that way. Yes, absolutely. And so the thing that I want you to consider here, the reason that, that he had this kind of courage and bravery is because his mission had a cause. He had a good reason for going and doing what he did. This was God's hidden plan. It was God's hidden wisdom from the beginning. God's plan was to undo the evil that Satan had brought into the world at the temptation of Eve in the Garden of Eden. When, when Adam took the fruit uh, from his wife Eve's hand and, and ate of it, sin entered the world. And God cursed the devil. He cursed the serpent who was, in essence, the devil. He said this in Genesis 3, 14 and 15. The Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Somebody said that after God cursed the serpent, he, he said, my life is such a drag. Anyway, uh, verse 15 he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, some translations say he shall crush your head and you shall strike his heel. And so God's hidden plan, God's hidden agenda from the beginning of time uh, was, was that Jesus would go on this mission to undo the damage that Satan had done by introducing uh, sin into the world. By, by tempting Eve, who uh, told her husband uh, to eat the fruit, who, you know, he, he went ahead and he did that, and, uh, and that brought sin into the world. And so the, the cause that, that brought Christ to this point to actually go into Jerusalem on this suicide mission was to die. And so I want to talk to you about the impact of Jesus' death. This was all part of God's plan. Jesus had to have real courage to do what he did. You know, when you read about his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, the night he was arrested and, you know, he was, he was uh, sweating blood and uh, he said, my soul is afflicted unto death. This was a very hard and difficult thing that he was called upon to do. And he went all the way through with it, this, this suicide mission. Uh, remember the definition, a suicide mission is a task which is so dangerous for the people involved that they're not expected to survive. Jesus knew that he would not survive uh, this, this week. But he went anyway. That's why we look at Jesus and we admire his courage. Amen. And we we glory in the fact that our Savior was a man of courage. Can you say amen? amen. He was not a weakling. Amen. He was not a pushover. He said uh, in the Gospel of John, he said, No man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. When he was talking about being the good shepherd. So let me talk about the impact of Jesus' death because we know he did go and he did die, okay? Uh, the first thing I want to consider with you 
Uh, there's just three uh, brief things I want to consider with you uh, concerning the impact of his life. Number one is his life, or his death rather, opened the way for men to be able to come to God. Amen. Uh, Matthew records when, he, when Jesus died on the cross, something incredible happened in the temple. Verse 50 and 51 of Matthew 27, it says, that, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rocks were split. Amen. And so it tells us that the veil in the temple which separated the holy place from the most holy place where the presence of God was, was ripped open from top to bottom, signifying that when Jesus died, the way into the presence of God was open for man. Amen. Before, nobody could ever go into that place except the high priest and only one time a year. You know, tradition says they used to tie a rope around the high priest's uh, ankle in case he did something wrong and God killed him. And that way they could drag his body out. But when Jesus died, the way to the presence of God was open. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, we read another verse that, that gives us this, uh, this understanding as well. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, that's what that's talking about, the most holy place, the holy of holies, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Through the veil. That's the veil that was torn. It was ripped uh, by God from top to bottom. And the way was opened for us, for anyone who would believe to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. His death accomplished a great deal. Amen. Um, in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except he come by me. This is why uh, uh, people who want to go to heaven, the only way is to believe in Jesus. Amen. To trust in his death and his resurrection. Amen. In the work that he did. And so Jesus knew what was going to happen if he went back to Jerusalem. And his, his disciples didn't know, and, and they tried to persuade him not to go, but they could not stop him from fulfilling his mission because his mission had a cause, and his, the cause of his mission was to go to the cross and defeat Satan. Amen. So this was the uh, second thing I wanted to point out. He opened the way to God, but by his death, he destroyed the power of Satan. Amen. That was, that was, he took his power from him when he went to the cross. Uh, listen to what uh, the Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter uh, 3, verse, uh, verse 8. It says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. The way that the Lord Jesus destroyed the works of the devil was to go to the cross and die there. Amen. When he went to the cross, Satan's power over man, which is, is the power of sin, was broken. So this is why we can be free. You know, we can be free from sin's power when we repent of sin. When we allow the blood of Jesus to cover us, amen, this is why it's so important for people to be converted to Christ. You know, conversion to Christ uh, isn't just saying, I believe in Jesus, it's, it's repentance from sin. It's bringing those sins to the cross of Jesus Christ where their power is broken off our lives, amen. The Bible says that when Jesus was crucified, Satan lost his power over those who believe in him. Let me, let me show you where it says that in Colossians chapter 2, <coughs> verses 13, 14, and 15. Colossians chapter 2. I'll give you a moment to, 
to get there if you're if you're turning in your Bible to this scripture. Colossians 2, verse 13, it says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So think about that for a second. He's, you were dead and he's made you alive. How? By forgiving your trespasses, your sins. Verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. This is talking about the law of Moses, the law of God. And it says, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I mean, if you're a criminal... And you break the laws, you go to court, you, you uh, are, are uh, found guilty, and you have to do time. They, they have what is called a rap sheet for people who break the law. They're lawbreakers, okay? And so there are charges that are against them because they have uh, sinned. They have broken the law. They've transgressed. They've done things that are wrong, and they've been found guilty. And so uh, that's what the law of, of God does. It, it proves us to be guilty. There's not a person sitting here in this assembly who has not broken a, a, a law of God. We've all broken his laws. That's why the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. Now, let's read verse 15. This is what happened at the cross. It says, he took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, in it. That's a very powerful verse that has it has a tremendous meaning. The New Living Translation says, In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, principalities and powers, uh, it always re, uh, refers to uh, satanic power. It refers to demonic power. And it says that because we've been forgiven, because our sins are forgiven, when we bring them to the cross, that the principalities and powers, the demonic power that has ruled our lives, that, 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 uh, uh, that uh, uh, power of Satan that Jesus came to destroy, it was destroyed at the cross. He was disarmed. Yes, amen. amen. He held us in 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 bondage. He held us at, at gunpoint or or uh, sword point or spear point, however you want to you know to look at that. We were we were slaves of sin. We were dominated by sin. We were ruled by it. But now, because of the cross, He has broken the power of the, of the enemy. Amen. amen. That's the glory of the gospel. Amen. That was his mission. And, you know, the scripture we read in 1 John, it said that he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. And that is something that is, uh, is personal to everyone who gets saved. Amen. And so the Lord Jesus gives life to everyone who believes the gospel. Amen. And the gospel message is not is not complex it's simple listen to what paul wrote in first corinthians 15 1 through 5 moreover brethren i declare to you the gospel which i preached to you which also you received and in which you stand by which also you are saved how many know if you believe the gospel you're saved if you hold fast that word which i preached to you unless you believed in vain for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ, this is the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and by the twelve. Amen. He was raised from the dead. The, the gospel is very simple. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. He was seen after he was risen from the dead. Amen. And he gives eternal life to everyone who believes in his gospel. Amen. And so his death was, was the result 
of his great courage when he went back to Jerusalem. Aren't you glad you have a courageous Savior? Amen. Amen. And, and so this courage that Jesus had was transferred to his disciples. So I want to talk to you about the courage of his disciples because, you know, it, this was something that was given to those initial disciples. And it's also been given to us as his latter disciples. Amen. And so we also need this courage. <clears throat> so initially the disciples had no courage. Remember, you read the, uh, you know, the, uh, the accounts of his arrest and, and, you know, when, when he was arrested, they all fled. Peter, you know, stayed and, you know, to his credit, he tried to fight, right? He pulled a sword and he, he chopped the ear off uh, one of the uh, servants of the high priest man by the name of Malchus. And, and what did Jesus do? He picked the guy's ear up off the ground and, and put it back on his head and healed it. <laughs> and told Peter, put your sword away, Peter. You know, it, uh, how, you know it, it has to happen this way. Okay, so, you know, but... They all fled. And they were all afraid. We know that Peter later denied the Lord. Even after he swore he never would. You know. And so. So you know we know initially. They had no courage. But. That was before. They saw Jesus risen from the dead. Amen. That was before he appeared to them. And and uh, and said, "Peace be with you." And and uh, he said, "Here, I'm not a spirit. Touch me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like you see me have." You know, in Luke's gospel, he asked them for some food, and they gave him food, and he ate it in their presence. And so that their joy was was fulfilled. Amen. They were like, "Wow, Jesus is alive!" Can you imagine how exciting that would be? You know, to to having going from. You know, the grief and the sorrow of his death to the evidence of his resurrection and the, the awesomeness of his resurrection. And then not only that, but then then uh, they, they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. After he ascended into heaven the, on the day of Pentecost, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was with them. Jesus came back in the form of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now he was living inside of them. And can I tell you something? He lives in us. Amen. 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 They, they, after, after Pentecost, these disciples were unstoppable. Amen. You know, uh, they're being threatened in John chapter 4, in verse 18 and 19, it says, so they called them. These are the same men who, who uh, condemned Jesus, okay? They called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Amen. So they threatened them, sent them away, and those disciples went out, they prayed, and it says uh, in verse 31, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Amen. They were unstoppable. They would not stop. They kept on preaching the gospel. Then in Acts chapter 5, they're arrested. An angel comes and frees them. In, in verse 28 and 29, uh, again, they're before the high priests. And it says, they ask them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. And so there again, you know, they, they, you know, they're being threatened. This time they were beaten and sent away. And it says that, that they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to sh suffer shame for his name. Amen. They were, they, they rejoiced that, that they were being persecuted because the way they saw it is, uh, you know, hey, uh, wow, we, we get to suffer like the Lord suffered. <laughs> they hate us. You know, most people don't rejoice over being hated. People do, what, they'll avoid, avoid anything that'll make them look bad because they're afraid of how people uh, think about them. I mean, no, as Christians, we, we have to only 
be concerned with what God thinks about us. So they were unstoppable. They obeyed God instead of men. And they, they had the same kind of courage that Jesus had. Yes. Amen. They had the same spirit that he had. And the only thing that stopped these men from preaching the gospel was death. Did you hear me? The only thing that stopped them from preaching the gospel was death. They all knew that their mission, like Jesus' mission, was a suicide mission. They knew they would not survive it on this earth, but they did it anyway. They weren't insane, they were brave. Amen, they were courageous. You know, somebody said, courage is not the lack of fear. Courage is having fear and overcoming it and doing it anyway. Amen. So, you know, sometimes we, we're afraid. Sometimes we feel intimidated. Sometimes, you know, we don't, we don't feel like we have the boldness uh, to stand up and preach the gospel on the street corner. But I'll, I'll tell you something. If we follow in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus, we'll overcome that fear. Amen. He wants us to be witnesses for him in the earth. And that means that that means that we have to overcome the fear of sharing the gospel with other people. We have to overcome the fear of man. You know that the Bible says the fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. Amen. It's a trap set by Satan. You know, that, the Bible says that there were many who believed in Jesus, but they wouldn't confess him because they were afraid of the Jews. Because the Jews had said, if anyone, uh, you know, confesses him as, as uh, Messiah, they're going to be kicked out of the synagogue. They're going to be ostracized. Christians have been ostracized. For centuries they have. But that, that goes with, with, the, uh, uh, with the territory. And so we live in a world that is becoming increasingly hostile to the Bible. It's becoming increasingly hostile to the word of God that, that some Christians preach. Because not every Christian, not every church preaches truth. You know, some are uh, avoiding some of the truths, you know, of, of that, that must be spoken. If people don't understand what the Bible says or what God says in his word, what is right and wrong, uh, what will happen is they'll, they'll believe that what is wrong is okay. You know, that, that is the whole idea of being woke. You know, on, the, on our banner we have the word, not woke, awake. Because, because we live in a world that wants to water down the truth, confuse it, and make it so that so that, uh, you know, things that the Bible says are an abomination to God uh, are passed off as something that is normal. You know, if you, I don't know how much you follow the news, but if you, if, if you follow uh, the bill that was just passed in Florida, uh, where they're, you know, the governor signed the bill that was passed, and they made it a law in Florida that you cannot teach kindergarten to, to third grade children about transsexualism and homosexuality and, and you're not a boy, you're a girl. Uh, they made it a law in the state that you cannot do that to these children. But there are groups who are so mad over that. They call it a don't say gay bill. And, and uh, they're, they're, they say you're harming people by this bill, and uh, recently uh, Walt Disney came out, not not Walt Disney, but the Disney Corporation came out and said they're totally against it, because they're pushing, they're pushing transgenderism and, and homosexuality, and, and uh, they're, they're, they're trying to include this more and more in their cartoons, and you know who they're targeting? They're targeting children. Absolutely. And they're very upset at anyone who will stand up and say, that's wrong. That's sinful. 
So the world is becoming increasingly hostile to Christians who live and preach the word of God. And so I just want to say to you that none of us are going to get out of here alive unless the rapture happens. If the rapture happens, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And it could happen at any moment. So all of us need to be what some have termed rapture ready. You know what that is? Your heart's right with God. You're doing God's will for your life. Amen. You're being obedient to God. You're, you're keeping your accounts current with the Lord. Meaning that you're not letting sin slip into your life and letting it remain. And so we have to settle in our hearts and in our minds that we also are on a suicide mission. Our lives don't belong to us. They belong to God. Amen. Our lives belong to Jesus. And that means that we, just like those early disciples, just like the Lord Jesus, we must be willing to do what God's called us to do. Amen. And it's going to require courage. It's going to require us to not be afraid of what people think. Amen. Don't be afraid of what your classmates think. Let them know you're saved. Don't be afraid of what your co-workers think. Tell them about Jesus. Amen. Pray with this, pray the sinner's prayer with them. Invite them to, to come to church so they can get to know Jesus for themselves. Amen. We're living at the end of days. We don't know when everything is going to happen, but we can see it coming. Amen. The handwriting is on the wall. And I just want to encourage you to have the same kind of courage Jesus had. We know it'll cost us. We know people may not like us. They may not flock to our church. But then again, they may. <laughs> Amen. Because, you know, it's when it's all said and done, people, they really, they really do want the truth. They don't, you know, people don't want to go to hell. What happens is people get deceived. They're deceived and they need to hear the truth somewhere. And Jesus came and he told them the truth and he knew. He said, I tell you the truth and you want to kill me. They're like, you got a demon. We don't want to kill you. But they did. That's exactly what they wanted. But what they didn't understand was by doing that, they fulfilled God's purpose. Amen. They fulfilled God's purpose. And so God has people that he wants to save and, and he needs people in, the, in his church who will have the same kind of courage that Jesus had. We're not going to get out of here, out of this world alive. Like I said, unless a rapture happens. And we're not trying to kill ourselves, but we know that it's going to cost our lives to serve the Lord and to win others to Christ. Yes. Just the same way Jesus knew it was going to cost him his life to save us. Amen. But he also knew that after his death, that he was going to be raised again to everlasting life. And we know that as well. Can you say amen? Yes. Amen. We know we will also be raised. We're going to live together with Christ forever. So let's be about our Father's business. Amen. So let's pray. Let's ask God's blessing as we bring our service to an end. Perhaps you've come today and you're not right with God. You need to appreciate what Jesus did. I know it's not being really pressed in the world. It's not being preached anywhere but in the church. But perhaps you've come today and you're not right with God. You must be born again. That's what Jesus said. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. It remains a mystery to you. But if you will open your heart and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you'll repent of your sin, if you'll turn away from your sins and forsake your sins, God will forgive you and you'll have a new life in Him. But it's a choice, it's a decision that everyone must make. 
You know, the Bible says that the gift of God is eternal life. But just like any gift, somebody can offer you a gift, but if you don't receive it, it's not yours. And so what I'm offering you today is the gift of eternal life. I don't have it, but Jesus does. And we can pray. We can pray to him and he'll hear us. And you can receive the Lord as your Savior. If, if that's what you want, you want to give your life to Jesus. You want him to give his life to you. And you want to pray so that all your sins can be forgiven. I'd like you to do one thing for me. I'm going to pray with you. And I want you to do one thing for me so I know. Would you lift your hand? Lift it up and hold it for a moment. Say, yes, Pastor. I want you to pray with me. I'm not right with God, but today I'm going to get right. Perhaps you're backslidden. You did serve God, but today you're going to repent of your backsliding. Quickly, raise your hand and let's pray together. Amen. Okay, then I'm going to say that the prayer, the sinner's prayer with maybe you're watching online and, and you want to pray to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so if you do, bow your head and say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross to take away my sins. That you rose again on the third day to give me a new life. Lord, I repent of all my sins. I'm sorry for them. Jesus, come into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. Help me to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that, you meant it, God knows. God heard you and God has forgiven you. And so we're going to take some time this morning. We're going to open the altar here at the church for prayer. Maybe you really need God to help you. You need to have the same kind of courage that Jesus had. Remember, those disciples were afraid. They saw him die. They knew he died. They were dismayed for, for three days until... Jesus rose from the dead and they saw him alive. And their faith was renewed. Their, their sorrow was turned to joy. Then they were empowered by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And then there was no stopping them. They were filled with the Spirit of Christ. That same spirit of courage and boldness. Amen. But it filled them and there was no stopping them. The only thing that stopped them was death. We need that same spirit. God, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with boldness and courage to take the gospel to people in our world that are lost. And believe me, there are plenty of them. And so let's take some time. I'm going to open the altar for prayer. And, and you really want, you really want to have the same kind of boldness and courage that Jesus had willingness to face the hatred of men because there was a cause and the cause was the salvation of souls that's our cause too amen so we're going to take some time we're going to open the altar for prayer we're going to sing a song of worship in your presence amen let's sing that together let's stand in this place amen we're opening the altars and telling you to come, find a place to pray. Ask God to give you that same boldness. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Shiko Robo Amen. Amen. Let's pray together that God will give us the same spirit that Jesus had. Amen. The spirit of boldness that, you know what, I know this is going to cost me, but I'm going to do it anyway because this is the will of God. Amen. This is what God wants. He wants to save people and he wants to use me in that cause. Amen. So let's pray together. I want you to say this with me. Uh, lift your hands to heaven and say, Jesus, Jesus thank, you thank you for the courage, for the courage that, you that you showed in going to the cross for me. I know that you feared, but you overcame your fear. I'm asking you, Lord, to help me overcome my fear. Give me boldness and courage to share the gospel with other people that I know. Deliver me from the fear of man. Help me, Lord, to only fear God. Lord, I give myself to you to do your will. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, with the courage that I need to stand for God in these last days. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's worship him. Hallelujah. Oh God, send your Holy Spirit. Fill your church. Fill your people with boldness. Praise be to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God is good. Can you say amen? Praise God. Amen. So we're going to let you go today. Amen. We appreciate all of you. Amen. Don't forget that, you know, the reason you're saved and in your right mind is because Jesus was willing to go on a suicide mission. Amen. And give his life for every one of us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So let's pray as we dismiss. Uh, Brother George, would you close us in prayer? Oh, Lord, I thank you, God, that we could come here this morning and hear your word, God. I pray that you would be with us this day, God. I pray for each one of us, and I pray for the ones that are not here, God, that you would touch their lives. And I thank you for all that you do. 